Oregon League of Conservation Voters and the Oregon Environmental Council are the state's two largest environmental and public health advocacy organizations, and we are thrilled tonight to have uh, provide Oregonians from across the state an opportunity to join us to discuss the important issue of uh, dangerous chemicals in our food supply and what we can do to solve that problem. Specifically tonight, we'll be talking about the issue of bisphenol A, which is a chemical that's used to manufacture food containers. Um, there are currently two, uh, two uh, bills in the Oregon legislature um, that would like to change laws about uh, bisphenol A and, um, in fact, ban the sale of food containers manufactured with bisphenol A, um, sold um, containing children's food. Um, we're here to talk about that and the um, problem in general. We are honored tonight to have Governor John Kitzhaber join us for the call. We also have uh, Senator, Democratic Senator Jackie Dingfelder representing Northeast Portland and Republican Senator Jason Atkinson representing the Grants Press area of Southern Oregon. They are two co-sponsors of Senate Bill 695, which is one of the bills I just mentioned, which will um, ban the sale of children's food containers manufactured with the dangerous chemical bisphenol A. Um, before we get into our program and we hear from the governor, uh, I just want to let everyone know how the Teletown Hall will work. I'm sure for many of you this is the first time you've done something like this. Um, we will have literally thousands of Oregonians on the call this evening. And we want to give as many of you a chance to ask questions when we get to that part of the program in about 10 minutes. In order to ask a question or to make a comment, all you need to do is hit star three on your phone and you will, be, you will go through to an operator who will take your question and then you will be put into the queue. You actually won't be able to ask a question until we call your name and then your line will be opened and you'll be able to ask your question directly to Governor Kitzhaber or the state senators on the phone. Um, so that's star three to ask a question. You can actually do that now if you want to get in the queue. Um, so um, the only request we have when we get to the question and answer period is that you try to keep your questions as brief as possible because we want to give as many Oregonians an opportunity to make comments or ask questions of the elected leaders we have on the phone tonight. Um, also, I want to say, if you want to find out more information about this issue, once we are done with the call, you can do that by going to um, one of two websites. Uh, for the Oregon Environmental Council, it's oeconline.org, or for the Oregon League of Conservation Voters, it's olcv.org. Those are the two websites with the most up-to-date information on this issue and a number of other environmental and public health issues that we're working on. Also, if at any time you would like to be signed up to get more information and be part of the effort that is going now, especially to try to protect our children from bisphenol A, which is the, the dangerous chemical we're going to be discussing tonight, you just hit one on your phone and that will sign you up to continue to get more information. Um, okay, so with that, um, it is my great pleasure to um, introduce Governor John Kitzhaber, who we're honored has taken the time tonight to discuss this issue with us. And we're going to start by uh, a few remarks from our governor. So, Governor Kitzhaber, take it away. Thank you very much, John. And I want to thank everyone who's taken the time to call in this evening to discuss this important issue. Uh, I'd like to take just three or four minutes and provide a context for why this legislation is so important. I think we all recognize that chemicals have certainly improved our daily lives, but uh, at the same time, there's growing evidence for years that many of these uh, chemicals are toxic and have harmful effects on our health and the health of our environment. Now, this is an issue that uh, I've been concerned about for a long time. In fact, some of you may recall when I was governor eight years ago, I issued an executive order to reduce the release of hormone-disrupting contaminants to protect kids' health and the environment. But there's still obviously a lot more we need to do if we're going to safeguard uh, this generation of Oregonians as well as the next. Banning the female A, as John indicated, from children's food and beverage containers, I think is a very, very important next, next step. As you probably know, BPA, as it's referred to, is a chemical that's added to plastic containers and also to the lining of canned food. Uh, research shows that it leaches into the food and the drinks these containers hold and ends up in our bodies. And even tiny amounts of BPA in our systems can adversely impact our health, and that's simply not acceptable. Now, I'm not the only person who sees it this way. The evidence about BPA is of such great concern that Canada and the European Union have already banned it from kids' products. 
The FDA here in the United States, which regulates these kinds of products federally, has also spoken out about its concerns regarding BPA, but it doesn't have the ability to ban it under our current regulatory framework, so it, it's up to uh, the state to take action. In fact, nine other states have already passed BPA bans, and I think Oregon should be the next, which is why I strongly support uh, Senate Bill 695, the uh, BPA Free Baby Bill. Uh, not only will this legislation protect kids' health, it will also have the effect of saving uh, taxpayers millions of dollars in medical costs and give families peace of mind because parents will no longer have to worry that they're buying sippy cups or baby bottles that might make their children sick. There's also another issue here that involves environmental justice that I want to touch on for just a second. Consumers are already demanding BPA-free products from their kids and, and, and themselves, and the market is actually starting to respond, but not fast enough. And some major retailers are making an effort to offer these BPA-free products, but we know it's still readily available at a number of discount stores like dollar stores. And that's not only a public health issue, I think it's an issue of environmental justice. All families, regardless of their income level, should have the same access to safe products for their families. And without legislation like this, there's simply no way for consumers to be sure that any product is truly BPA-free. So as governor uh, and one who has put the economy and job creation first, I think that uh, we uh, should encourage our Oregon businesses to benefit our state by using their leadership in green chemistry. You know, we have one of the world's leading green chemistry departments down at the University of Oregon. And we have the opportunity and I think the obligation to find safer alternatives to BPA and, in fact, to other toxic chemicals. Because ultimately, BPA is really just one example of a widely used chemical that is toxic to all of us. And if we can simultaneously focus on creating safe alternatives to these toxics while taking a smarter, more comprehensive approach to how we deal with them by focusing on chemicals of concern that are known to have impact, uh, harmful impacts on health, I think that we can help Oregonians prosper and live healthier lives. So Senate Bill 695, the BPA Free Baby, Baby Act, makes uh, ultimate sense to me as a, as a uh, governor and also as a, as a former physician. And I look forward to working uh, with the bill co-sponsors, uh, Senator Atkinson and Senator Dinkelder and their colleagues in the House and Senate to pass this bill. Let me finally say in closing that one of the major efforts I've undertaken this year is to reform the U.S. health care system and focus it more on front-end prevention and wellness. And clearly, if we can keep people out of the acute medical system in the first place, it saves millions of dollars and also improves the health of the population. Senate Bill 695 is in perfect alignment with the larger strategy to address health care costs in, in the state of Oregon. And that's another reason I'm a strong advocate of this legislation. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Governor Kitzhaber. Um, and uh, Governor Kitzhaber will be on the phone um, here to take questions from our participants from across the state. Um, before we do that, we want to hear from uh, the co-sponsors of Senate Bill 695. Um, and the first person we're going to hear from is Senator Jackie Dingfelder. Before I do that, I want to remind participants on the phone that if you want to ask a question or make a comment, you just need to hit star three on your phone and you will be transferred to an operator who will get you into the queue. If you have a question that you would like to ask already, I strongly recommend that you get into the queue um, because we will start to line up questions very quickly here. Um, so, uh, Senator Jackie Dingfelder, uh, we want to hear from you on Senate Bill 695 and um, take it away. Great. Thank you, John. And it's an honor and a pleasure to be here tonight. I, I worked on this bill last session. I was the chief uh, co-sponsor of the bill last session. And unfortunately, we couldn't get it through last session, but I am optimistic that we're going to get it through this session. And I'm really thrilled to be on the phone with my chief co-sponsor, Senator Atkinson, or one of my chief co-sponsors uh, this session. So BPA isn't all bad. You've heard about some of the concerns, but it was first introduced in the 1930s as an estrogen replacement. In the 1950s, we learned that BPA is great at making plastics harder, and, it's, and it is good when it's used in things like car bumpers, uh, bike helmets, and other items that keep us safe. However, uh, BPA, there are concerns about uh, the health impacts of BPA, and the reason that I've been a champion on this bill is because I'm concerned that BPA is bad for our health. It's commonly found in clear plastics, including baby bottles, sippy cups, and baby formula containers. It's also the primary component in the epoxy lining of most metal food cans. 
BPA has been shown to leach out of these products and into food, and eventually it winds up in our bodies. And once in our systems, BPA disrupts the normal balance of our hormones and it has been linked to certain cancers, diabetes, reproductive problems, developmental disorders, and other serious health problems. It's especially harmful in young children and those whose bodies are still developing. In fact, the Food and Drug Administration, otherwise known as FDA, FDA at the federal level, has raised concerns about BPA's harmful effect on children's brain development. That's a problem when there is BPA in young children's products. This is the main reason that I'm championing Senate Bill 795 to reduce children's exposure to BPA. Now, what this bill does is it prohibits BPA in baby bottles, sippy cups, and infant formula cans. This is not a ban on all products or food containers that use BPA. Instead, BPA will be prohibited in food and beverage containers that are intended for use by young children. It also eliminates the sale of reusable water bottles that contain BPA. And I just want to mention that many other states in, in the nation have already passed this with strong bipartisan support. But our bill calls for the first in the nation labeling requirement on metal food cans which contain BPA. This will give consumers the information they need to make better formed in, in decisions. Now, why, you probably want to know, why is Oregon doing this, and why are other states doing this? Well, we would like the federal government to act on BPA, but so far there's been little federal activities on these and other harmful chemicals. States have a history of stepping in when the federal government fails to act. In fact, Oregon was one of the states that banned DECA, and that action contributed to a nationwide phase-out of this uh, harmful chemical. Oregon now has help with banning BPA in young uh, can now help banning e BPA in young children's products because once again we can be a leader uh, in in uh, in uh, making sure that this product doesn't get to the market. Nine other states, including the state of Washington, has already passed similar legislation. As I mentioned before, these bills were passed with strong bipartisan support, with some receiving unanimous support from all the legislators. Now, Oregon's children are just as important as the children in these other states, and we simply can't wait any longer for federal action. So with that, I'm hoping that you'll join me and, and my uh, co-sponsors in supporting this bill, and we're hoping that you will contact your legislators to ask them for their support, and I think you're going to hear a little bit more about that later. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Senator Dienfelder. That was great. Um, you know, the great thing about uh, Senate Bill 695 and the bill in the House that will uh, ban the sale of children's food containers with bisphenol A is they're bipartisan bills. And we are uh, also honored tonight to have the other co-sponsor of Senate Bill 695, Republican Senator Jason Atkinson from Southern Oregon. So, Senator Atkinson, I'm going to turn it over to you. Well, thank you. I'm, uh, I, too, am delighted to be here this evening, and uh, this is my first tele-town hall, so I'm trying to imagine that I'm talking to a 1,000 people, but uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, you know, as I was getting ready for this evening, um, I was thinking about our, my own family, uh, which my son was born under some very difficult circumstances and, and spent a long time in Dornbecker, and uh, when we went through that experience, we – you know, we're first-time parents, and we went through all of the, all the worry, but we had worry and trauma um, put on top of that. And worry and trauma and learning about every possible combination of something that would help our son. And we had learned about, you know, the difference between, and it was told to us by the medical community, the difference between the good sippy cups and the bad sippy cups. And that was really my first introduction to EPA and its, a, its potential harmful effects on children. Um, in, in my experience, you know, our house was completely BPA-free, and we, we went through, uh, as, as most people do when they have little children, as, as you start to be in a network of other people with small children and, and to know about uh, the opportunities to not uh, make that purchase. I think Governor Kitzhopper made a fantastic uh, comment about environmental justice. 
and the fact that not everyone has those abilities uh, to make the decision between uh, what's best for their children by way of these sippy cups. And so that is a very interesting motivator for me. I think that this is something that you want to have uh, banned for every child, and certainly I think it's a wonderful opportunity. The, the next reason why I'm excited to be on the bill is, is frankly, it's bipartisan. And I think Rogovians are asking state leaders to be bipartisan, to put partisan labels and rank her down, and to work together. And so on that note, I think that this is really an important bill, not only for the health of children, but also I think for the health of the institution and state government. Uh, we've gone many years being unfortunately partisan, and I'm optimistic that this bill, along with others, will, will give um, our returning governor and the new legislature a chance to start fresh by being bipartisan. So I'm very excited. Um, as, you, as my colleagues have, have mentioned this evening, um, the states, Canada, the EU, um, even some countries in Africa and I know in the Middle East have started to ban BPA for uh, products uh, that would be used with children. Um, I find in my own travels uh, overseas that th this isn't even an issue. Um, you know, if quite honestly, as an aside, neither are plastic bags, but perhaps that's another tell town hall. Um, but I find it just very interesting that in Oregon, um, we have the opportunity now to really be a state that, that leads. I think that our past uh, experience in our state by being an environmental leader probably will bring the attention, perhaps the momentum to, to do what my colleague said about getting federal action. But notwithstanding, Oregon has had a long history of setting the pace for other states to follow, whether it be DEC, as you've mentioned, or even going back 100 years and, and leading the, the amendment to the Constitution that would create direct election for U.S. Senators. Oregon has always been out in front. We have always relied on the strength of our people. And uh, given that uh, history, I think that if Oregon does it, um, whether it be a bottle bill or a beach bill, um, other states will follow. So um, I'd just like to close my uh, remarks by saying I'm very thankful to be on the bill. I'm very excited that it's bipartisan. And uh, I want to make sure that, that all, all children in Oregon of, of various economic stratas, I suppose, um, are protected from BPA being in, in uh, what the doctors at Dornbecker call the bad bottles. So with that, uh, I'll hand it back over. Renee hackenmiller Paradis, who is Oregon Environmental Council's Environmental Health Program Director. She has a Ph.D. in genetics from the University of Chicago and an MPH in health management and policy from Portland State University. She's overseeing the effort um, to evaluate the economic cost to Oregon of certain diseases and disabilities that are attributable to environmental causes and um, dangerous chemicals. And I want to just give Renee a minute to make a couple of comments, and then we'll start the question and answer period. Go ahead, Renee. Great. Okay, great. Thank you, John, and thank you to Governor Kitzhopper and Senator Dingfelder and Senator Atkinson for participating in this important conversation tonight. I just want to reiterate a few high points that have already been covered for people who might have joined the conversation late. Um, we're talking about bisphenol A, BPA. It's a hormone-disrupting chemical, which means that it can mimic or block hormones and disrupt the body's normal functions. We know that BPA doesn't stay in the products in which it's used and is detected in over 90% 90 per 90 of Americans tested. Hundreds of studies have linked BPA to health concerns, including early puberty, low sperm count, miscarriage, diabetes, obesity, cancer, and improper brain development in children. And BPA is particularly harmful to young children and pregnant women, and that's our, our biggest concern and why we feel passing Senate Bill 695 is, is very important. It's important to OEC, OLCB, and all of the BPA Free Oregon Coalition partners, including the Oregon Nurses Association, Oregon Medical Association, Stand for Children, and dozens of other organizations. We believe Senate Bill 695 is an important step protecting the health of Oregon children and hopefully will lead to protections for children throughout the country. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, John. We're going to go ahead and start with our questions. And the first question is from, and I'm going to say your name and then your line will be opened up. Our first question is from Anna Hannon from Grand Ron. 
Anna, your line is open. Okay, thank you. Uh, my question was, this is such a toxic chemical. Why do we not ban it in the state of Oregon, this phenyl A? Is this something that is possible or not? Uh, this is uh, this is Taylor Kissauer, John Kissauer. There may be others who want to weigh in on this. I think the, there are some practical challenges of trying to ban the chemical uh, itself. It's in, as as uh, Senator Dingfelder said, the chemical uh, does have some uh, practical and valuable uses uh, because it does make plastic harder, and there there are areas where it does make sense. So what we're trying to do is is uh, selectively, essentially ban the sale of products that contain this drug that uh, are in food and beverages, uh, beverage containers for our children. So I think we're trying to uh, make a, di a distinction between the, uh, the, the appropriate use of this chemical in plastics and the inappropriate and dangerous use. Uh, is that, would you say that's a fair statement, Jackie? Yes, absolutely. And uh, we are trying to protect the most vulnerable uh, populations and uh, concerned about, especially young children, about their interaction. Uh, I think also once there are alternatives on the market, uh, you will probably see a transition in, in uh, possibly other products as well. Uh, so I think that once the, the market changes, then uh, and the alternatives become more available, you may see other products change as well. But we've really tried to focus this legislation on targeting the most vulnerable uh, people, so to speak, in the state, and that's children and babies. Okay, great. Um, so our next comment or question is from Ed King um, from Eugene. Hi, um, this is Ed King, Eugene, um, as you heard. Uh, I just want to – actually, I don't have a question. I'm not uh, – uh, I haven't developed a question because I don't have any doubt about the importance of this legislation. I want to commend the legislators, Atkinson and Dingfelder and our governor, for – supporting this bill. I think BPA is uh, very dangerous, and I think that this is a very uh, a responsible action. It's uh, very limited. It's narrowly drawn. It's aimed at uh, population at risk. And I think, uh, once again, Oregon leads the way. It's kind of like the Oregon Health Plan or a number of other areas in which we've developed policy and uh, responsibly uh, uh, advanced it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ed. Uh, and our next, uh, we'll go to our next question. Our next question is from Bernita from Springfield. Bernita? Bernita, your line's open. Cap All right. Hi, I'm curious with the cafeteria trays. If in the schools they have it there, if the BPA levels are coming out, how much would be coming out on the cafeteria food or with them, with the children? Renee, you want to take that question? Yeah, I'll take that question. This is Renee hackamiller Paradis from Oregon Environmental Council. And um, really, it's, um, it's when it has contact with food that causes it, that initiates a chemical reaction that causes it a leach. So on a food tray, we're really not going to get very much, uh, we're probably going to get no, no impact of it. Um, it's pretty solidly bound there. You have to have those chemical reactions like you would have in a food can to have it be leached um, and then end up in your body. So that's, where, that's why this legislation is focused on food contact items because we know from a large number of studies that that's, how we get the most exposure to it and how it gets into our bodies. Okay, thank you. Um, our next question is from Linda Douglas from Seaside. Linda, your line's open. Go ahead. Okay, I just um, had a thought about all these problems with plastic and why aren't we looking into uh, biodegradable, safe plastics like I understand can be made from corn? Okay. 
Ms. Governor, Ken Schauber, John Ken Schauber, uh, I think that's a great question. I think that's a, 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 a separate but very, very important thing. So, you know, to the extent that we can begin to replace uh, particularly petroleum-based uh, disposable products with, uh, with the products that uh, are biodegradable, I think we solve a whole host of issues, not just the, uh, the toxic issue, uh, but also that's a, uh, a, a huge environmental issue from the standpoint of trying to reduce our carbon footprint. Okay, great. Uh, so we're going to keep moving along here, and the reason we're moving along is we're trying to give we have a, we have a lot of questions. A lot of people want to ask questions or make comments, so we're trying to get through them as quickly as we can to give as many people an opportunity. Um, our next question is from Bob Pearson from Tigard. Bob, your line's open. Thank you. Um, I was wondering what alternatives the uh, plastic manufacturers have. Is there a appropriate hardener that could be used at about the same cost uh, when fabricating their plastic? Hello? Yeah, Bob, this is John Kitzhauer, uh, and there may be others who want to comment on this. I think, that, I think what we're trying to do here is create a, a market demand for uh, uh, plastic products that don't contain BPA in, in, in the food and beverage area. And there are, as we mentioned earlier, some large uh, retailers that are offering, already offering um, BPA-free uh, plastic containers for food and beverage. And we, we hope and believe that this kind of legislation will actually increase the, the, the market demand. Uh, and as J uh, Senator Dingfelder pointed out, um, there are other uh, appropriate uses for this chemical that will continue to support uh, the, uh, the, uh, the plastic industry. So I think this is. I think the problem is, as Jackie said, we're beginning to see the market respond to this demand, and we hope this will do two things: one, immediately begin to protect uh, our most vulnerable citizens, our children, and uh, secondly, uh, help uh, shift the uh, uh, the market dynamics. Do any of our other guests want to comment on that question? Well, this is Senator Dingfelder. I'll just add, I think the governor did a, a great job, but I will add that there are alternatives out there. There are, there are uh, retailers that are carrying BPA-free products already, but what we're trying to do is make sure, as I think Senator Atkinson mentioned, that uh, this is not going to be a, an equity issue, that people can, that can afford to shop at those stores or buy those products and other people who can't are left with the products that have BPA. I think there are alternatives out there. The uh, plastics industry has uh, been working hard to look at alternatives, and uh, so they're available. Uh, there are products out there that are BPA-free. We're just trying to make sure that uh, all the children's products are BPA-free and that uh, even our uh, all of our citizens are protected. As far as the lining of cans, that's something that we're still working on for some products. Tomatoes is an interesting one because uh, the can manufacturers have been working to come up with a, a BPA-free lining that won't interact with the acid in tomatoes. And so, there, you know, we have a lot of really smart chemists that are working on this uh, in the United States. So it, it's something that uh, we're in transition, but as far as the sippy cup and the baby bottles, those products are already available now. Okay. Um, before we go to our next question, we want to just take a quick poll of everyone who's on the phone. And uh, this is the question, and you just answer yes by hitting one or uh, oppose or no by hitting two. There is currently legislation in Oregon's legislature that would ban the use of bisphenol A in baby bottle and sippy cups and some containers. If you support the effort to ban the use of BPA in these products, press one. If you oppose it, press two. Okay, and we're going to go to our next question. And this question, we actually have this question from a number of people. So if you've asked this question, we probably won't get to it. We have five different people who want to ask a similar question, and that's about the FDA and bisphenol A. And that, uh, so Debbie Bishop from Portland, uh, you're on the line. Go ahead and ask your question. Um, I have uh, been wondering why the FDA has con enough control to ba just arbitrarily ban some things, but something like this 
has to go through a legislative legislative process. Why can't they just say enough is enough, take it off the market, and put an end to it? Why does it have to go through this huge process when the FDA has as much power as they do? So, Debbie, this uh, is this, Senator Dinkfelder, and that is an excellent point. And the reality is that the FDA moves very, very slowly. They've only banned uh, a number of, a handful of products over the years. And unfortunately, because of the lack of leadership at the federal level, that's why the states are taking this up. And frankly, this is not the first time that we've seen it. We've seen it with many other chemicals and many other policies. And, and the way that Congress is right now, where it's very split, I'm sure you know, there's a partisan divide, Frankly, I think that you're going to see states taking more and more of the leadership. So I absolutely agree with you. I think the FDA should be taking federal action, but in the absence of that, I certainly as a state senator am not going to sit around and jeopardize the health of our vulnerable citizens when we can take action at the state level to to do this, to implement this ban. This is Senator Atkinson. I would agree. I, I think what you're seeing uh, is – the ability for the states to do it and with the states and with the businesses that are in our states, for instance, the food processing industry, um, we will demonstrate essentially to the federal government that not only is this good policy, but that business will respond and, and everything uh, we can, we can get this out of the hands of, or actually out of the food stream. Um, I think waiting for the FDA is like waiting for a lot of very great, Things to get, uh, I think, a, a lot in the pharmacy world, the, the, the long length of time it takes for breakthrough drugs to get on the market after they go through rigorous and all the time spent at the FDA level. On the, on the flip side of that, for as much protection as built in on the pharmaceutical side, we also have that long drag of time uh, for things that are harming uh, children, in this case, BPA. So... Um, the fact that the states are involved, to me, isn't alarming. Um, I think it's actually good news. Okay, thank you. So uh, let's move to our next question, um, and it's from Nancy Nicholas in southeast Portland. Nancy, go ahead. Your line is open. Nancy, are you still with us? Sounds like Nancy. I'm going to ask her question for her because it was a good question. She wanted to know, um, is there any way to know which products on the on the, uh, on the the shelves in grocery stores are manufactured with bisphenol A, and will this bill, the legislation, will the, the bills address that in any way? That was Nancy's question. It, I, I was going to say, this is Senator Dinkfelder. I don't want to jump in and answer all the questions. Uh, and, Renee, do you want to say anything about this? Sure. This is Renee. I can answer that. Um, so there are, when you look for baby bottles and sippy cups, there actually are a large number of them that are now labeled BPA-free. But there are, still are products on the shelves that don't say if they're BPA-free or not, and so you're left guessing. Um, and then when you're talking about canned food, you have almost no way of knowing. Um, and there's actually lots of false information out there. And um, this brings up a, a point that um, we saw recently on this phenol A, that this phenol A is one of the top greenwashed products. So claims will be made that something is this phenol A free, and um, it's, there's no guarantee that that is actually meeting a standard. And so I do think that one of, these, one of the things that um, SB 695 will do is guarantee that any baby bottle or sippy cup you pick up is BPA-free, whether or not it's labeled such or not, and then also provide consumers information to make a choice that's important to them and their families. Okay, thanks, Renee. Our next question is from April Scott from Independence. Hi there. Um, I was wondering if you guys know that uh, the water coolers in all of the state buildings that everybody drinks from are number seven plastic. And uh, since I work in a state building, I see pregnant women drinking out of them all day long. 
And uh, people don't know, is there any move to get any labeling done, transition to glass? Uh, this is uh, John Titzauer. Well, uh, if that, in fact, is the case, there's an effort underway now. Oh, good. That is the case. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I, I appreciate you for bringing that to my attention. I had, was not aware of that. Yeah, yeah and this is Senator Dingfeld. There are many products, frankly, that have BPA that we don't know. Uh, I agree with you. I, you know, one of the things that we decided in this bill is that we had to start somewhere. And I, I'm going to be honest with the thousands of people on the phone, when I worked on this last session, it was not an easy lift. And the reason it didn't pass is because uh, the chemical industry is a very, very strong industry that worked very hard to defeat this bill. I mean, this, is a, this means a lot of money. This is a big money uh, maker for them. And so we decided we've got to start somewhere, and, you know, we may come back and try to add more products, which I think we should. But uh, you're absolutely right. There's many products, uh, you know, many products. People, I see people drinking, my colleagues drinking out of plastic bottles all day long that we don't, I don't know if they're BPA-free or not. So there's many products out there that we shouldn't be drinking, and I'm really glad the governor uh, is now going to look at water coolers in our capital. Great. Thank you for bringing that information up. Um, so our next question is from Kevin Rash from Salem, Oregon. Kevin, your line is open. Yes, uh, I support the bill, and we'll we'll call my senator and and representative to uh, to vote for for its passage. I was curious uh, which agency would have enforcement or oversight to uh, ban these products in Oregon. Uh, this uh, this kind of gesture, I ha I don't I have not seen the bill itself, so maybe one of the senators could uh, respond to that. I assume DEQ would be involved and in, and in possibly business and consumer affairs. Uh, uh, Governor, this is Senator Dingfelder and and uh, listeners out there. Actually, the Department of of Health, and we've been working very closely with the Department of Health uh, because they would be involved. We do have a comprehensive toxics reduction program in the state, and, and the Department of Environmental Quality is part of that. Uh, certainly there would be the element of consumer protection, but the uh, public health is the, is the sort of connection here, and so we've been working very closely with the Department of Health on this issue. One of the things, it's, it's unfortunate, but our, as you know, we're going through some tough fiscal times, and we want to make sure that they've got the resources to enforce this bill properly. So that's one of the things that we'll be working closely with the, the governor on. But that's that's the main uh, part of, of the enforcement for this bill. Okay, great. Um, I want to remind folks on the phone, because we actually still have had some people join us in the last four or five minutes. If you would like to ask a question, to hit star three on your phone, and that will get you in the question queue or to make a comment. And we're we're just taking them in the order that we've that we've gotten the questions. Um, also, if you would like to sign up to get more information about how you can help this effort, um, just hit one on your phone at any time, and that will get you uh, registered to receive more information after the call. So our next question is from Robert Blue from Astoria. Okay, uh, my question is, a newly released study that um, I believe was released just this week shows that estrogen-type chemicals are found in other plastics, including BPA-free products, that some of the other um, hardeners and softeners also um, create this type of problem. And in some cases, even the BPA-free products have higher levels of uh, the estrogen type products. So has this been considered yet? Uh, and the study also shows that high heat and low temperatures cause the most leaching. Uh, Rachel, you want to take that? Oh, sorry, yeah, Governor, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to, I was going to uh, punish, punish Rachel. I was simply going to say that I think that uh, I have not seen that study, but I don't at all doubt it. I think that we are uh, just beginning to scratch the surface of the number of uh, uh, toxic agents that we take for granted that are all around us in our environment and that contributes to the mortality and morbidity of, uh, of our citizens and to huge uh, 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 health care costs downstream 
And um, obviously, this, this bill begins to tackle that problem, but I wouldn't want anyone to think that uh, this is an end point. It's rather a, a beginning point. Renee, did you want to comment on that? Renee, did you also yeah. want to make a comment? Go ahead. Yeah, this is Renee, and I am familiar with that study. Um, first, I want to say that um, one of the compounds, that one of the most commonly used compounds for the BPA-free bottles is um, has been shown to not have um, estrogen-like properties, but that doesn't mean that the, all the other types of plastic out there don't. And um, it's really just, I mean, it's, it's symbolic of, of some bigger flaws in our, in our chemical regulatory system that we allow chemicals to get on the marketplace that can have these impacts. But, I, you know, I, I fully support what Governor Kitzhopper said, that we need to start someplace, and it's going to be a long, um, you know, long challenge to completely fix the system. But this is a place that we can start and something we can tackle, while at the same time continuing to work on those issues to make sure that the next chemical that comes onto the market doesn't have these properties. So working in parallel, um, to, to try and solve a bigger problem. Okay, thanks, Renee. Um, our next question is from May Medlock. And May, if you could let us know where you're from, because we didn't get that information for you. Hmm. Oh, Portland, Oregon. Okay, thanks, May. Go ahead. Um, all right, the question I have is, which kinds of canned foods would this be a problem with? And also, frozen food, that is in plastics, would that be a problem? Frozen foods that you buy in plastic. Renee, do you want to answer this? Yeah, I'll answer that. So as far as um, canned foods, there are a number of canned food companies which have made a switch to BPA-free products. So if they're um, Eden Organic food, Eden Foods is one of them that they, they package their um, for 10 years, actually, they've used a BPA-free liner. Um, Muir Glen, which is a subsidiary of GM, they have um, just started packaging their um, tomatoes in BPA-free cans. For every other kind of canned food, you're probably safer to assume that it does have BPA than that it doesn't. Um, as far as um, frozen packaged food, that type of packaging typically does not have this phenol A in it, and it doesn't have the same kind of reactive properties that um, food cans do when they go through the food processing part, and that's, that's one of the things that really contributes to the leaching of EPA from cans. So um, frozen food um, is not going to have the same levels of um, EPA, bisphenol A, that a lot of your canned foods were. Um, but that's one of the things we're trying to do in this bill, too, is is you know there are Oregon food processors who are working on BPA-free cans, and um, you know we want to encourage that um, and and see how Oregon can innovate and lead on on something that's that's obviously lacking in this um, area right now. So hopefully the bill will get passed and we'll be able to do that. Okay, and I want to give everyone on the phone one last reminder if you want to ask a question to just hit star three on your phone and you'll be uh, transferred over to an operator who can get you into the question queue. We only have a few more minutes to do that. So if you want to get a question in, please do that now. Um, our next question or comment is from Jim Brown from Tigard. Jim. You can. Okay, Jim is not with us. Um, so we'll just, I want to get as many in, so I'm just going to move along to the next question. Um, uh, so Marcy from Portland, you're still on the yes, phone? Yes, my, my question to you is, with Oregon having one of the highest unemployment rates in the country, and those of us who are working will not be receiving any raises, where are we supposed to get the money to buy these special products? This is, uh, this is John Ketzauer. Well, I think the point here is that um, we're trying to ensure that these products are available um, uh, to all Oregonians, and right now they're only being offered by some um, larger um, retail stores uh, and not at a price that everybody can afford. And uh, I think one of the purposes of this bill is to address the this issue of environmental justice that ensures that people, regardless of their uh, income level uh, have access to, to safe products. Uh, Jackie, do you want to add something to that? Well, I think that's a great point, Governor. And what we're trying to do here is 
I've incentivized the market because, in essence, once these are more readily available, they will not be any more expensive than what's currently available in the market. Once uh, and and in you know this will uh, certainly change once more and more of these products are available. As you've heard, uh, many states have already passed this. Then that will help uh, keep the cost down of these products. Uh, I have bought BPA-free products. The price difference is not huge. Uh, and I think that once these products are the only product that is available on the market, the, the costs uh, will be probably equal to what's available now. Uh, and uh, they are sold in many stores already, but like we said, unfortunately, uh, not all products are BPA. So what we're trying to do here is to ensure equity. Uh, no matter what income you are, it sh I totally agree with you, it shouldn't just be people that can afford to pay more get these products. We want to make sure that they're available to all Oregonians, including low-income Oregonians. This is Senator uh, Jason Atkinson. I just want to make one quick comment on this point. Uh, in, my, in, in my family's experience, the price really wasn't the issue um, between a BPA uh, sippy cup and a non-BPA sippy cup. But what was the issue was availability. And while we could easily find... Um, these products for, for babies uh, in Portland, it's very difficult to find those products and those products availability in rural Oregon. So if you're in Lakeview or if you're in Burns or perhaps if you're on the Oregon coast, there's not a, there was simply just not the same amount of choices, at least in our experience, that we, that we found. We're, we're an active family. We travel around a lot, and kids lose their sippy cups. And so we have experience looking around and trying to find them. Um, uh, what's exciting about this bill is that everyone, regardless of where they live, will have those safe sippy cups for their children. And that's that's uh, I think that is just one of the one of the fantastic things about this bill. Okay, great. And uh, we have time for one more question. And uh, we want to, uh, the next, so that final question is from Kelly Chapman from Marcola, Oregon. Yes, I was going to ask if the Gerber baby food tubs, um, now they're selling the Gerber baby foods in plastic. Um, they're like a rectangular shaped tub, and they have a plastic lid, and they also say that you can microwave those in those plastic containers. Do you know, are those chemical-free as well? Because I know I sure fed my baby a lot of those Gerber baby foods. Renee, I think uh, we're going to punt to you on this one. We're going to punt to me, yeah. This is Renee. Um, the, um, well, first, I wouldn't microwave any kind of plastic. That just, that's a whole other call. You just, that's, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't advise microwaving anything in plastic. But um, um, those containers are not... This phenol A, they're not. Um, they actually are a different type of plastic, um, which has been around for as long as BPA, and it, it doesn't have the same types of endocrine disrupting properties that BPA does. Um, that being said, there there probably is a little bit of this phenol A around the seal part of it, um, but again, you know, our main concern is with the food contact and trying to limit exposures which you're going to get from the food. Um, so, you know, from our perspective, those those um, plastic rectangular um, baby foods are a better option than um, ones that come in a can or that come, even the glass jar ones, actually the lids um, have BPA on the um, lid too. So it's not a perfect solution, but it's better and it's, again, it's, you know, it's pushing the market um, and they'll hopefully eventually get there with legislation such as six, um, Senate Bill 695. And Renee, can't uh, Oregonians go to OEC's Oregon Environmental Council's website for more information like this? They can at www.oeconline.org. You have information about specific products and things like that. We do. We have specific yes. products and pictures of products for helpful information. Yep. Great. Okay, well, thank you, everyone. To wrap up, I'd like to give uh, Governor Kitzhaber uh, uh, just a minute to make some closing comments, and then we will be wrapping up. So, Governor, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Well, thanks very much. First, I want to thank all the Oregonians who took time to call in here, and I particularly want to thank our two 
uh, legislators for their courage and leadership in pushing this piece of legislation. Again, I think this is a very, very important first step to try to address some of the many uh, toxic substances that are having an impact on the health of our children and our population. Uh, and I think this is a very, very important step also in a larger effort to rein in costs in our health care system and create a system that actually improves the health of, uh, of, of our citizens. So, uh, again, strong support of the bill. I hope you'll have an opportunity to contact your legislators and uh, tell them that you also think it's a good idea.